The content of this channel is for mature audiences. Parental discretion is advised. You're tuned in to the Green Gorilla Channel. Please make sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and hit the bell notification button. And please, feel free to share the video. Thank you. What's good? <laughs> Everybody! I'm the G with a PhD, man. You're tuned in to the Green Gorilla channel. It's the place where black men can express themselves freely, straight up, no chaser. Now, what I'd like to do is to talk about a brother by the name of Jawanza Kunjufu. Now, Jawanza Kunjufu is an educator, lecturer, and for the most part, he's a consultant. And what he typically has is advice for parents, educators, community, and church members uh, on a wide variety of issues dealing about or dealing with the black community. And one of the books that he wrote was called Countering the Conspiracy to Destroy Black Boys. Now, in this book, what he does is he provides a guide for ensuring that African-American boys grow up to be strong, committed, and responsible African-American men. So he thinks he has the answers, okay? So in the book, he answers a series of questions such as, why are there more black boys in remedial and special education classes than girls? Why are there more girls on honor roll? When do African-American boys see positive black role models? Is the future of black boys in the hands of their mothers and white female teachers? And when does a boy become a man? And in the book, essentially what he does is he asserts that there's a significance in rites of passage activities, which include, but are not excluded to, mentoring, male bonding, and African-centered spirituality. And he describes all that in the context of his book. But, you know, I'm not going to give a lecture on every idea that he comes up with. But I think what I'm going to do is break down his covering of several topics related to the book in a video series. So, anyway, man, let's do that, man. So, the first thing I'm going to do is look at a few scenes and to see what Dr. Kunjufu has to say about black boys. So let's do it, man. You didn't know that a white boy with a high school diploma makes more money than a white woman, black woman, a black man with a college degree? <laughs> Wait a minute, man. See, look. Kawanza done hit him up already. Not Kawanza. Jawanza. He already hit him up. And I like it, man. I like this. No, in fact, I love this. Okay? Because he's coming off with empirical data straight out the gate. A white boy with a high school diploma earns more money on average than white women, black women, and black men. That's something that has to be considered. Now, this was presented in 1986. It's 2021. And most of these conditions still obtain. And then you have to ask yourself, what's the reason? Why? Let me, let me continue on with Dr. Kunjufu. The motive for the conspiracy is clear. For the question of why is there a conspiracy, the answer is white male supremacy. In other words, mm -hmm. white men are not afraid of women, black or white, because women have no power anywhere in this world. The threat to European men will come not from women, it will come from other men. And the best way to destroy black men is to destroy them as a boy. <laughs> oh, no, man. <laughs> oh, man. I'm not laughing because I find this funny. 
I really actually find it humorous and I'm laughing to keep from crying because it's sad. Some of the things that I hear, you know, and not to take away from black women or the efforts that they make to reach towards justice. But the reality of the situation is black men are a threat to white men. And that's the reason why they have selected black men. They have targeted black men for gender side, but nobody wants to pay attention to this. Now you have theories in the academy, such as intersectionality, which for the most part argues that women are the most oppressed members of society because they're a member of a class of persons who are racialized and subjected to sexism. If they're queer, then they're subjected to heteronormativity and they're also poor. So that's a quadruple factor right there. Okay. But what it fails to take into consideration is anthropological and historical analysis, which demonstrates that, you know, on average, man, time and time again, if you want to destroy a population, you start off with the men. But let's continue. Let's move on. The motive is white male supremacy. But mm -hmm. before you get comfortable blaming somebody else, let me make sure we're clear. On a conspiracy, there would always be two. You see, you have the active conspirators and you have the passive conspirator. See, it's like child abuse. There were always two. You have the father who does mm. the beating, active. But you have the mother who turns her back, passive. Isn't apathy, indifference, low expectations, buying hot goods in the black community, isn't that also part of a conspiracy? You have the active and you have the passive. Mm. You know, this is a good point because a lot of times people like to absolve themselves of responsibility or hold themselves unaccountable on account that they haven't actually done anything. They haven't committed an action. But what here uh, Jawan Kunjufu is doing is he's illustrating or demonstrating that an act of omission can sometimes create as deep a problem as an act of commission. But yeah, that, that's good, man. So let me get back into it. In a conspiracy, there would always be two. Let me now give you the starting line. We'll start with the active ones first and then move to the passive. Leading off, batting in the number one position, representing this country, institutional racism. Batting first is the president. He bats in the number one position. Look, I said this before, I'll say this again. And he's already said it a little bit earlier in the video, but what's the root of the problem? The root of the problem is white men. They're the ones that set the stage for all the seeds of discord. And we already know who the chief of the country is, hmm, the president. Right now we got I guess in many black people's eyes, a white savior in Joe Biden. I think that's absolutely ridiculous. But, you know, okay, well, I digress. Batting second, representing the Trilateral Commission, the Fortune 500, big business, David Rockefeller bats number two. And, ooh, you know what's interesting about this? I did a video on a Trilateral Commission. And... It may have gotten some views, it may have not, I can't really recall, but it's interesting to note that the head of the Trilateral Commission was a member of the Democratic Party. His name was Jimmy Carter. He was the chief, the president. So the position that was occupied by Reagan was occupied by Jimmy Carter. He's the instantiator the initiator of supply side economics. He's the one that got all of this started. But a lot of people like to blame it all on Reagan and the Republicans, when in actuality, it was the Democrats that kicked all that off. But again, I digress. Batting third, representing the military complex. You didn't know black people, 12% of the population, one third of the military, and died 41% of the time in the Vietnam War. The chief of staff. That's number three. Man, 
<laughs> man, I gotta laugh again, man. I can't help but laugh again. And I'm laughing because, you know, I remember when I had first graduated from college and, you know, I had this idea in my head that I was going to be a fighter pilot. Now, mind you, I'm 6'3". Most pilots are not, you know, especially people who are in the military and they're flying fighter pilots, excuse me, they're, they're uh, flying fighter planes. You need to be a certain size because, you know, the, the cockpit is compact. So I never would have fit in there anyway. But anyway, man, I took the ASVAB and I basically qualified to be an officer in the military because I already had a college degree. I would have went straight to officer training school. But I had a conversation with my father and my father had been in the Vietnam War. And one of the things he suggested to me was, man, do not go and fight for these white people. Don't do it. And his reason was simple. They're going to put you on the front lines. They're going to expose you to the most risk. And when you come home, you're not going to be able to reap the benefits that the white men in the society are able to, you know, to reap. So if I were you, you already got a college degree. If I were you, I'd leave it alone. And so I did. But, you know, that's a, that's a side point. Let me get back to it. Batting fourth, and I don't mean Marlon Brando, I mean the real godfather. Drugs running rampant in the black community. Don't, please don't deceive yourself. If America is the number one power in the world, they could police their borders to stop the drug traffic. Mm -hmm. These men and what they represent intentionally want to make sure the black boys never grow up to be men. But remember, they got some help from some of us. Who mm, but before he gets into the point about they got some help from some of us, you know, I don't know how much credence I want to give to the argument that drugs destroyed the black community uh, or the crack era kind of like destroyed the black community um, because, you know, I, I like to study neuroscience and there's a neuroscientist by the name of Carl Hart at Columbia University. And I think he, uh, through human e experimentation, I think he pretty much demonstrates that most people who use hard drugs don't become addicted to drugs. Now, I'm not saying that there aren't a large amount of people. Uh, I think maybe about 12% of the people who use hard drugs actually become addicted uh, in such a way that they're not functional. They can't go to work. Uh, they can't enjoy leisurely activity. But most people who use drugs, even hard drugs, and there's a lot of people who use them, okay, to this day. And there are a lot of people in the academy who've experimented around with illicit drugs. Don't get it twisted. I've heard the stories. I've sat at the tables, okay? But I think, you know, there's an overemphasis on the amount of damage that drugs did. I think more than anything else, poverty and a lack of education and a failing educational system is the culprit. But uh, we'll get to that in a minute, I think. Who really like black boys, who may even have black boys at home, just didn't know any better. And so we bat number five through nine. Batting fifth, not all, but some, some mothers who raise their daughters and love their sons. Mm. Mm. Man, I've heard this talking point again and again, and I think it rings true. A lot of mothers raise their daughters, but they love their sons. They're not as hard on their sons. They don't expect as much out of their sons as they do from their daughters. This is just, I think, a failure to educate and to nurture and to, you know, contribute to the development of a healthy, flourishing, and functioning black male. And I don't know what suggestions he's going to come up with, but, you know, whatever standards you have for your daughters, you have to also have for your sons. You can't just love your sons. You have to ensure that they're getting the same quality of education as your daughters. This is imperative. It's necessary. But, uh, you know, I digress. Batting six, some female teachers who don't understand that boys have different learning styles than girls. Batting seven, representing the media in this country, shows like Gary Coleman and Webster. Shows that make me sick. Shows that illustrate that black men cannot raise intelligent black boys to be men. 
In other words, we need a white father for Gary Coleman and for Webster. It's all part of the media image. It goes all the way back to Tarzan. All the way back to Superman, all the way back to Rambo, to Rocky, all part of white male fantasy trying to control the world. Hmm. You know, you know what? I never really looked at those shows in that way. Um, I mean, it's the idea that there aren't black men around to raise thriving, flourishing, and functioning black boys, so you need to give them over to white men. They'll do a better job at it they'll be able to handle the situation better than black men who, by the way, are fathers and are more involved in the lives of their children than the members of all the other races. They're there more. They provide more nurturing and caring. And they pay child support more. Yeah, there's that. It's all private scheme. Make sure you heard me. It's consistent with Superman, Tarzan, Santa Claus, the white father, all part of that scheme. Batting eight, the macho image, Mr. T, and we'll look at today someone like uh, Prince or Magic Johnson or Isaiah Thomas. In other words, no need to study, just be macho, just be a superstar. In other words, Mr. T, Prince for entertainment, Isaiah Thomas or Magic for, for sports. And then last but not least. Mm. Before he gets to the last but not least, you know, today, the same point rings true whether it's you know having ambitions to be you know a rapper a, a movie star an athlete you know these kind of you know images and this kind of hope and prayer that you could reach you know one of those levels in relation to notoriety and success it's elusive it's a dream it's a fantasy and this whole macho image you know the thug image of rap music, I mean, women love this shit, okay? But then one has to ask the question, is this even real? Is it overcompensation? I think it is. And, you know, look, I'm from the trap, okay? And I know guys when they're 12, 13 years old, and how they transmorph into something totally different by the time they hit 17, 18 years old. Now, it's the stark reality of an environment that can be cruel and harsh. Cause I mean, look, it's dangerous in the trap. It's dangerous in the ghetto, okay? Uh, but at the same time, you know, this idea that you can overcome the harsh realities of American racism by means of being a thug, you ain't gonna be able to do it, man. It's not, <laughs> it's not a viable option, but let's get back into it. It's a black woman by the name of Kathy who do anything for a man and a black man by the name of Willie, who does not feel good about himself. You see your faces right now. Who's Kathy? You have to stay to the end to find out who's who. The starting lineup, Reagan, Rock, no, you don't know who Willie is, though. We got a new theory for you now. We used to end with Don and Kathy, but now we're going to give you the Eddie Willie theory. We have a new one. So we have David. Yeah, man, so. I don't know if I'm going to be able to get with him with the last part about a woman named Kathy who will do anything for a man because, you know, nowadays, you know, these women are independent. This is, nine, uh, excuse me, it's not 1986. It's 2021. And most of the heads of household in the black community are black women. And these women are raising these boys alone. And we have to reconsider this kind of model of parenting. And it's promoted by white liberals, feminists, intersectionalists, all variants of feminist uh, thought. But we got to begin to rethink this model because while it might be okay and it might be working to the benefit of black girls, it definitely doesn't work to the benefit of black boys. So it's something for women to consider and to think about if they have sons and they really love them. If they have younger brothers, nephews anyway man i'm the g with a phd you're tuned in to the green gorilla channel until the next time man i holla at y'all man i'm out here one